Okay, so let's get started. Um, I want to introduce Jennifer Cardenas. She is an education advocate. She has presented at the APFED um, annual meeting in the summer, and she also works with many of the families who are members of APFED, so she's very familiar with your issues um, and a lot of the concerns that you have. Okay, I'm going to turn this over to Jennifer, if you can unmute your microphone. And you start. start. Good evening, everybody. I'm really excited to be able to share this opportunity with you guys to um, give you a little bit more information about how to effectively advocate for your child in the school environment. Those of you that attended the meeting this summer, uh, the PowerPoint is, is very similar to what you may have seen. However, um, I want to also open the floor to any questions uh, and discussion as we're going through all of this. Feel free to tap, type your questions into the chat box at the bottom of the screen. And if it's relevant to that slide that's up, I'll address it uh, at that point. And if not, then I'm just gonna kind of run a parking lot of things that we will cover after I'm done. Another little piece is, I know that some of you all submitted some questions before or at the time you registered, and I will address as many of those as I can once the PowerPoint is concluded. So hopefully everybody can hear me okay. If you have any difficulty, please feel free to type so in the chat box so that I can adjust my volume accordingly. But without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. So a couple of things I wanna clarify. Number one, I do talk a lot about the law, specifically about Section 504 of, um, of Certain Disability Acts. And then um, I talk a little bit about IDEA. And I want to be sure that you guys are clear. I'm not professing to represent the law. I'm not an attorney by choice, um, but I'm very, very familiar with it. That being said, there are certain facets of the legal guidelines that do vary from state to state. So overall, we have federal regulations that guide how schools are supposed to implement the things that we're discussing, but there are some variances that that are affected because of the individual state or district you're in. There are three basic rules that I try to help tell everybody to abide by when you're talking about advocating for your child in the school. First of all, get everything in writing. Um, there's an old saying, if it's not in writing, it didn't happen. And unfortunately, that's kind of true. It's not because of malice, but because the nature of how much multitasking and how many things are going on at any given time during the school day. Second of all, stick to the facts. So it's very hard to advocate for your child as their parent. Being a parent is an emotionally taxing and fulfilling and wonderful opportunity, but it also can be very difficult for you to effectively speak for your child in the school setting. You need to stick to what's the facts. What, what are the concrete objective items that we have data to back up? Number third, the best thing that you can ever do for your child is to teach him or her to be a self-advocate. As your child progresses through school, you're not always going to be able to be up there within five minutes of receiving a teacher's phone call. Um, those IEPs and 504s will stay in place as long as they need to. But there are also going to be times that your child is going to need to speak up for him or herself. The best way you can do this is through your own example. Our natural inclination is obviously to protect our child. Um, I have three kids myself, so I completely understand that. But it's also important that we're very uh, encouraging of our children to understand to the extent that it's possible what it is that they're dealing with and, and what he or she is able to ask for within the, the school setting. So let's talk about a, what is a disability because a lot of times that's a hard thing to wrap our head around. This is one of those legal things that I was talking about. Um, so Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 basically just defines a, anybody who has a disability as somebody who has a physical or, or mental impairment substantially limiting one or more la major life activities who has a record of such impairment or is regarded as having such an impairment. Those impairments are any physiological disorders or conditions that affect one or more of the following body systems. 
eosinophilic disorders, we're talking about digestive, and that's very clearly outlined in the law. In the Americans with Disabilities Act Amendment of 2008, Congress did add some additional examples of life activities, and eating was one of those life activities. The law is very clear, and the supporting documentation that the list included is not intended to be exhaustive, um, but it's very fortunate for our kids that they have gone so specific as to say digestive body systems and eating because this has helped raise some awareness about the impact that eosinophilic disorders can have on our children. So FAPE is a common word. We, in, in special education, we have a lot of our own little acronyms. FAPE is one that frequently gets tossed around, and that's a free and appropriate public education. All individuals with, with or without disabilities are entitled to FAPE. Now, an important caveat about this is appropriate is not the best, it's not the most ideal, and it's not what's going to help your child achieve his or her fullest potential. It's what is appropriate and necessary for him or her to receive a meaningful education. So I want to back up a couple of steps. When I talked a little bit about um, Section 504, you'll notice that I acknowledge that there needs to be a disability, that that disability needs to be recognized by somebody, and that it needs to, be, it needs to affect a major life system. There is not an educational impact necessary in order for Section 504 or for a 504 plan to be initiated. So let me repeat that. There does not need to be an educational impact in order for a 504 plan to be initiated. I get very frequent phone calls and emails from parents saying my school has refused a 504 plan because they said my child is performing on grade level. And I have two responses to that. Number one, 504 is not just about the performance educationally, but also access to that education. Which as we know, if our kids cannot be around certain foods, if we cannot have food activities in the classroom, if we need to be aware of um, life-threatening reactions, etc., that's just access and being able to participate in the, the academic day. The second thing is educational progress looks not only at academics. So when I'm talking about academics, I'm talking about reading, English language arts, writing, math. We're not just talking about that and about the grades. We're also talking about social, emotional, and behavioral impacts that may occur within the school setting. Um, just want you to tuck that in the back of your minds because it's a very, very important thing to remember. So if we want to initiate a 504 plan for our child and my rule of thumb is if your child has an eosinophilic disorder, he or she needs to have a 504 plan in place. I'll talk a little bit more about this later. But when we're going to get started, we want to make sure that we have good medical documentation. Medical documentation would need to include a basic description of your child's disorder. Eosinophilic disorders are very hard to describe, let alone try to explain in simple terms but to the fullest extent possible, that's what needs to be provided to the school. It needs to include an impact of the disorder on the child's daily living, including possible reactions or what the, the possible negative outcomes could be. And then we also would like for the doctor to provide some accommodations necessary to maintain safety and quality of life in the school environment. This is kind of a tricky one, but if you all have or will, when we're finished here, take an opportunity to look at the AppFed website. Um, there are several sample documents on there. One of them is a document that you can take to your doctor to help come up with this medical documentation letter. Another one is um, there are lists of different types of accommodations, and so maybe that's something that you can also take to your doctor as well. So when we're going to look at how do we get support, the very first thing we need to do is request a meeting in writing to discuss um, implementation of a 504 plan or determine what level of protection is actually necessary for the child. I'm going to go ahead and stop here. One of the questions that I received was um, about non-responsiveness of the school to these requests. 
my general rule of thumb, whether we're dealing with initiating a 504 plan or looking at getting other types of support in the school, is if you are not getting the answers you want, change your audience. So what does that mean? If you've repeatedly tried to contact your child's teacher to set up a meeting and you're not getting anywhere, go to the principal. If the principal is not being responsive, identify who the 504 or special education coordinator might be within your school that's generally listed on a school website. If you're not getting an answer there, go up to the district level. You can look at the school, the school district's website and get that information as well. But when we don't get answers, we don't just drop it because that creates patterns of behavior. What we want to make sure we do is that we change our audience. So after we've requested this, we want to de determine if maybe additional evaluations are needed. What I most commonly see from my kids with eosinophilic disorders is that we have um, those social, emotional, and behavioral impacts are what most predominantly come to the forefront. So the limited food may impact the child during the lunch setting. Um, there may be an impact behaviorally, whether it's because of food trials that are going on or because the child is acting out because he or she is tired of being different from his or her peers. You can request an evaluation through the school district to determine the extent to which that impact is being felt by the child. We want to provide medical documentation of the disability. And this speaks back to the previous slide. It needs to be in layman's terms. It needs to be, it needs to clearly outline what is the impact of the disability and what are some necessary accommodations that need to be implemented in order to make sure that the child can safely attend school and meaningfully participate in his or her classroom. Make sure the right stakeholders are included in the meeting. Only having the teacher there and the nurse is not going to be appropriate to implement a 504. You want to develop accommodations and supports that are necessary for a safe, meaningful, and appropriate education. I get a lot of questions about if a child should have a 504 or an IEP. Section 504 provides for accommodations for the child to access the learning environment. If your child's experience with an eosinophilic disorder does not impact their educational performance, so there's no negative academic impacts, there's no negative social emotional impacts, and there's no negative behavioral impacts, then your child will qualify for a 504 plan. If, however, your child's disorder does impact impact that educational performance and he or she meets additional eligibility criteria that will be laid out by your school district, then he or she should qualify for an IEP. One of the hallmark differences between a 504 and an IEP is that IEPs, which are otherwise known as individual education plans, include very specific goals and objectives that are intended to help the child make up deficits. So those deficits can be academic, which are the most easy goals to identify, but they can also be social-emotional deficits and behavioral deficits as well. I have tried to put together a fairly um, thorough list of accommodations that can be considered for your child or uh, categories of accommodations that can be considered for your child who experiences an eosinophilic disorder. Obviously, we have our medical accommodations. Um, I know that eosinophilic disorders are, they run a spectrum of severity. So in some cases, it may just be a matter of monitoring. In other cases, the child may need to have a whole separate bin and a separate area where certain foods are kept, certain safety and cleaning supplies, etc. That's one of the places where your doctor's input is going to be very valuable. When we're looking at medical accommodations, it is important that we make sure we are concentrating on what keeps your child safe and healthy at school. We also want to be reasonable. Being reasonable ensures that we have accommodations that your child can self-advocate for, as well as accommodations that will help minimize the differences between your child and his or her peers. We want to look at accommodations that may need to be made to the physical classroom environment or general population environment accommodations. This particularly relates to food in the classroom, 
food for um, instructional opportunities, as well as hand clean hand washing requirements, things like that. Communication plans can be included. They can be very detailed or they can be a little bit more open-ended. Sometimes our, we need to know exactly how much formula our child has consumed every day. Sometimes we need to know how frequently our child is going to the bathroom. Those are all things that can be included in a communication plan within our accommodations. Instructional accommodations relate directly to how the student is taught. So does your child need additional visual cues? Does your child need to have close proximity to the instruction, etc.? Those are the types of things that we're talking about under instructional accommodations. Testing accommodations is something that is frequently overlooked, but a very important factor in coming up with a good 504 plan for your child. If your child is very prone to vomiting, needs frequent bathroom breaks, um, or may have to have opportunities that are unscheduled to change something about the pump or to receive some additional formula, then testing accommodations are going to be important. The reason is because if you are one, if we have to implement testing accommodations for standardized testing, so we're talking about the Iowa tests, we're talking about COGATs, which are very common, it's a nationally normed test, and then we also have some of our statewide assessments. Here in Georgia, we have something called the CRCT, which is the Criteria Reference Norm Test. Um, those are standardized tests that have very specific guidelines within which they can be administered. In order for our child to receive accommodations for those standardized tests, the same accommodations need to be implemented on as many daily tests as possible within the classroom. If your child does have to get up to go to the bathroom frequently, is prone to vomiting, etc., that's going to create an environment where the student's going to need frequent breaks. Any break in the testing would be something that would non-standardize the test, unless it's already specific, specifically outlined. Um, I hope that that makes a little sense, but it's something that we need to make sure we pay attention to. Homework accommodations, this relates to the quantity of homework uh, that is provided. I know a lot of our kids get really fatigued, and by the end of the day, they're just done. So while homework is important, what we want to do is also make sure that that homework is meaningful. How much homework is being given? Is it necessary to do all of the numbers assigned? Can we make some accommodations so that maybe the quantity is not quite as intense, but we know we're reinforcing the skills this child needs? Absence, tardy, and homebound accommodations. A lot of times schools do have separate hospital homebound policies, but you can also include those accommodations within your 504 plan. Also, if you expect that your child is going to be frequently absent, which is commonly the case, or is frequently tardy because he or she has a difficult time getting medication down in the morning, um, is particularly susceptible to illness during the flu season, etc., there are accommodations that you will need to work out with the school regarding their attendance policies because your child's attendance policy will fall, out the no fall outside of the norm of what's expected. Party celebration and reward accommodations. We live in, a, in an unfortunate era where food rewards are very frequently given. Um, what I always like to say is praise is free and we need to be, be sure that we are very specific with what can and cannot be offered to our child and under what conditions. We also need to be very clear that we're setting forth reasonable expectations for parties and classroom celebrations. Field trip accommodations. Um, I have had at least three, probably more families who have contacted me because they were told their child who had a feeding tube could not participate in a field trip unless mom or dad went along. This is not true. This is a denial of faith. So there needs to be something in there that states who will be responsible for the child on the field trip and how those accommodations and that child's safety will be ensured. I talked a little bit about attendance before. Um, we want to make sure we're always documenting the absence. That doesn't mean it always has to come from a doctor, but if your doctor will outline that Little Jimmy does have a tendency to get sick in the morning, and if he vomits all his medicine, we're going to have to start over, and that can take a couple of hours. As long as there's an initial doctor's note, 
and you are well documenting that every every time that that happens this is should hopefully not become an issue we want to make sure that that's in the 504 though we want to confirm that our absences are accurately documented within the school a lot of different people manage those attendance records unfortunately stay on top of that make sure that excused absences are really excused and if they're not make sure that it gets taken care of stay in communication with your child's teacher and the school's administration now I say this with the caveat of constant communication does not mean texting your che child's teacher after hours. Make sure that you're still following the regular guidelines that have been set forth for classroom expectations. Also, it's important that makeup work is intended to provide a good foundational re or good foundational reinforcement. Homework, admittedly, a lot of times is fluff, and we want to make sure we stay along stay aligned with that. Also, you want to try and get makeup work as soon as possible so that if your child is well enough to focus for a little bit, but maybe not quite healthy enough to attend school, he or she still has the ability to see what has been worked on and that, that work will be familiar once he or she returns to school. I talked a little bit about hospital homebound plans. My rule of thumb recommendation is generally to set up hospital homebound contingency plans at the very beginning of school. We're coming up on flu season. We are coming up on times when um, I know strep has run rampant in the school districts down here recently. Uh, flu virus has been going around. Stomach flu virus has been going around. If you think your child is going to miss school, and, and generally I look at a week or more at a time because that's a lot of class to make up, you want to set up a hospital homebound plan. Um, I did have somebody ask me specifically how much time should be allotted for every day out. That is very individual district by district. Um, it is not something that is generally state mandated. It is certainly not federally mandated at this point. But what you want to argue is what will be provided that is going to ensure my child receives a meaningful accommodation. Um, or education, I'm sorry, within the confines of that hospital homebound plan. Another reason these attendance issues are so important is that we do have local truancy and educational neglect laws. Truancy is when the child is considered of age that it's determined he or she is deciding not to attend school. Educational neglect charges come on the parents when their child does not attend school. Typically those um, triggers or those kind of red neon signs go off at about 10 days of student absences. So if your child has been absent for 10 or more days that are unexcused, it is entirely possible you will receive a letter from the school stating that your child has had excessive absences and may be referred to social services. Um, the other thing is excessive absences can be an exclusionary factor from receiving additional support. So if at some point your son or daughter does start to have some educational deficits present themselves, if there have been excessive absences, they need to be documented as to why, so they cannot be considered an exclusionary factor that would prevent your child from receiving the additional support he or she needs. So here are some other resources as I explained before. Um, the App Fed website, I hope everybody has had an opportunity to look at it, and if you haven't, please go after, after the webinar and check it out. There, uh, the entire education section was created, uh, or went live, I guess, shortly after the App Fed conference this summer. Um, if there's anything that you'd like to see on there, certainly don't hesitate to let me know, either by email um, or somebody who is part of the organization know especially as it pertains to education. I created the content and I'm happy to make any revisions that you think are necessary. Rightslaw.com is a fantastic website that has all of the federal information about um, disability rights available. There are a lot of case law articles that are available on there, some fantastic blog posts, and I highly recommend it. COPA is the Council of, um, I believe it's Parents, Advocates, and Attorneys. It's also another great opportunity to look for some support. Disability is Natural is a fantastic one. Niche is great. FedaWeb is a place where you can go and actually find an advocate in your area. 
may have a yellow pages for advocacy on there. And then IDEA, this final website is the one where you can actually go and look up the very specific statutes related to IDEA, which is the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act of 2004. So with that, I would like to take this opportunity to try and address a couple of the questions that were raised during registration. Um, some of them I have tried to discuss as we were going through the presentation. Um, I received several questions regarding private schools and Section 504 plans. Generally speaking, a 504 is um, not available to students who attend private schools. Section 504 pertains to public schools because as we discussed, we're talking about a free and appropriate public education. Unfortunately, this is an area that can be quite frustrating because if a school, particularly a private school, does not feel they can accommodate your child, there's not a lot of protection for that um, because it was a choice that you made to enroll your child in that school. Therefore, they can also determine that they may not be able to meet your child's needs. Um, let me see. Uh, I think that that was a, an important one. I had several questions about ensuring that formula is consumed as it is supposed to be. Get your doctor to write a medical order. Um, and you should already have one, but it's really important that, um, that when a child is supposed to be receiving scheduled nutritional supplements, he or she gets them. And sometimes we need, especially if the kids are younger, we have to come up with some reward charts or some incentive systems for that. That's one way to do it, but it's also really important that the school is held accountable and understands this is not a negotiable um, facet of your child's education. I think that that was it. Um, I know that there were some questions about EpiPens. Um, Food Allergy and Anaphylaxis Network has some great information about EpiPens on there if you'd like to educate your school. Every state is a little bit different. I live in Georgia and it is a self-carry state, so children who attend school can have their, the EpiPen on their person at all times. Um, but you would need to look and see specifically what your state's guidelines are. AppFed also, I believe, has some information available, and Rights Law has some great information available about what some of the guidelines are regarding EpiPens in the school system. So at this point, I'd like to open up the floor. Um, if you have questions, please include them in the chat box at the bottom of the screen, and I will address them as they become available. The question is, uh, she understands 504s aren't for private schools, but what about IEPs? It's the same for IEPs. Um, an IEP is designed to ensure FAPE, which is a free and appropriate public education. Uh, there may be some opportunities that individually with the school you can look at, um, but IEPs also do not carry over typically into private schools. Charter schools also vary. Um, again, with charter schools, they do have a um, admissions sort of guidelines for them. Generally, however, if the school receives um, any public funding, then they are subject to those federal laws. So that would include charter schools, um, but again, you have to look at does the child meet whatever the qualifications are of the the child's medical needs. To recommend, recommending to prepare for preschool, um, this is really a very individual question and I know it probably wasn't intended to be, but the reason is because uh, different school districts have different opportunities for, um, for preschool attendance. So if your preschool has, if your public school system offers a public preschool, then all of those same things that I discussed earlier would apply. My recommendation would be to contact your school as soon as possible and let them know what your concerns are um, and kind of proactively go about addressing them. Think about what I like to encourage parents to make three lists. One is the sun, moon, and stars, and that's everything we want to have. One is just the sun because we know we can't live with that. 
without that. And one is the moon and the sun, because that's really what gives us a nice balanced day. Um, start with that. Pull out the things that are emotional. Look at what are the facts necessary to keep your child in school and safe. And then that's what you would want to make sure that you present to the school system or to the, the preschool that you would like for your child to attend. Bear with me because I'm trying to scroll up and down. Okay. Um, I always get this question and I need to just go ahead and include it in my presentation. So a lot of times parents will say, I have a fantastic relationship with my school. I don't feel like I need to have a 504 plan. This is just going to make everybody upset. That's great. And I'm glad that, you, that, that parents are able to have a good relationship and that, that things have been successful for the child. But the reality is um, we don't know when things at a school can drastically change. We don't know when a school district could experience some kind of a scandal that results in overturn or overhaul of, of the educators. We don't know when you might move very unexpectedly. We don't know when zoning lines can change. We don't know when a teacher could go out. There are two types of trusts. One is this emotional relationship-based trust, and one is something called contingency trust. The relationship-based trust is great, but it doesn't give you any kind of security. Contingency-based trust very specifically relies on these are the requirements, this is what's necessary to meet the requirements, and I know that things are going to get done because these contingencies are in place. When we're looking at our child's health and safety, this is what we need to focus on is that contingency. The school might cringe, it's going to hurt for a second, might be a little uncomfortable, but then once it's in place, you deal with it every year and just renew it. Or if there's a change that has to be made, you call a meeting and you amend it and you move on. It should not affect the relationship because it's a, effectively a business transaction. My thoughts on children with EE participating in school lunches and what accommodations should be recommended. I have a personal um, opinion on this. I think if your child's health and safety is an issue, then the number one priority as a parent is to make sure that that child stays safe and healthy in school. What I've had some parents do because the child feel it's, it's an important thing for the child to go through the lunch line because that's the social piece for them. Then there are a couple of safe foods that the child can buy and have access to and those are the only things that the child is allowed. Um, overall, because of cross-contamination, etc., it does make me very nervous to have ch children fully participating in the lunch experience. But that, as far as buying lunches, that's just my personal opinion, though. Um, to sort of piggyback on that, can you require a school to provide a lunch for your child that is free of his or her allergies? This gets into a realm that I am unfortunately not as familiar with. Um, I know that there are some laws regarding what a school does and does not have to provide with pertaining to specific foods, especially for food allergic kids. However, I'm not sure exactly what the parameters are of that. Um, so I would talk to your school about that. My concern would always be con cross contamination. So while it may be something that the school is required to do, and it wouldn't be that you require the school to do it, it would be that the law supports this inquiry. inquiry. Um, but it, while it may be possible, it may not really be in your child's best interest because there's no way to ensure that cross contamination cannot happen. Um, regarding whether or not 504 plans and IEPs transfer state to state, yes, they absolutely do. Um, that's one of the nice things about them is if you know that you're going to be moving or you may think you'll move in the next six months or maybe not, then what you want to do is make sure that that plan is locked tight because when you go to the next school district, whether it's a, a district over, a state over, or across the country, the school is still required to take that under consideration as they're developing the plan for the student's upcoming year. Um, generally what happens with IEPs is that we look at um, what are the current goals and objectives and are they appropriate with that particular school setting. So there's usually a provisional plan that will go in place for a short amount of time. 
Um, okay, so high school student um, who was very ill and fell behind. I think that you need to immediately call a meeting with your schools. Um, I would start with your special education department. Um, the hospital, whoever is responsible for hospital homebound coordination, and um, the first thing you need to do is look at remediation and how are those skills going to be made up, that, or how are those things going to be not necessarily made up, but that that information um, going to be provided for your student, that instruction going to be provided, and then look at how does that information need to be modified or accommodated so that your child. Um, can receive a meaningful education. It's a very, um, that would be a very individual thing that you need to work closely with, with the school counselors, special education, general education, and probably some administration from the school. It will be an ongoing process and it will require a lot of work, um, but it's definitely something that's worthwhile. If your child is found that the academic deficits are resulting from the disability, he or she has until they are 21 years old to complete their education towards that general high school diploma. So that's something important to keep in mind. Definitely be proactive. I know it's very difficult when we're dealing with medical issues um, to think about school, but we need to go ahead and, and be as proactive as possible about that. Are schools required to provide ingredients to establish a, food, a few safe foods? Um, I would ask for I would ask for that. I don't know if they're required to. I would certainly think it's something that um, that you can look further into. And if they tell you no, and this is a rule of thumb for everyone, if a school tells you no, you always want to ask for the policy that supports their decision in writing. Should you shoot for the IEP? I assume that this is coming from the student who is in high school. Again, this is a very individual thing, not knowing what the 504 plan looked like before. I don't know what accommodations were in place and were or were not followed. Um, it would sound to me like the medical condition certainly is causing uh, academic deficits. So I, my off-the-cuff recommendation would be to request IEP eligibility consideration in writing, and that will help initiate the process. Um... Does some, well, that's what I do. <laughs> Does someone offer services on how to come up with a thorough 504 plan? I try to include as much information about how to develop a 504 plan from the ground up on the AppFed website. Um, you can go to that fedaweb.org and look to see if um, there is a resource in your area that can provide you with that. Homeschooling is a little bit, a little bit tricky um, because for these EE kids, it's very difficult socially and emotionally already. And so when we take the school away, it can be very challenging. Now the thing is, the schools are required to provide a free and appropriate public education. So while the case is complex and it's very daunting to think about needing to explain this to the, the school and getting them to understand, there are certainly opportunities for that child to be educated. Um, there are certainly opportunities for the school to receive some education. And they really have to make accommodations so that your child can stay safe in the school environment. If your child is getting ready to enter preschool and is not of quote unquote school age yet, because school age I think most states is six and that's somewhere around kindergarten, then you can start by trialing for a couple of days a week, maybe one day a week to start out slow and then wean your way in. Um, but I would try first. That's kind of my general rule of thumb. Um, you know, this is a very, would a school share at the school? This is very case by case basis. We have to be very careful with HIPAA, which are, are the privacy laws. I'm sure you're all very familiar with because you sign a million documents at the doctor's office. Um, if you are willing to share that, I, I would think that the school can help support that. Um, I know a lot of times for schools that have to implement strict hand washing guidelines for some of the children in their classrooms, there will just be a sign outside that says, this is a hand washing classroom, you must 
in your hands for 30 seconds prior to entering the room. Um, with regards to foods and what is or is not available for birthday treats, parties, things like that. Um, you know, you're looking at at that more emotional based trust of a parent willing to do that kind of thing. It's abs if you're okay with sharing it, then that's fine. The school can generally say there's a student in the class with a severe X allergy. That's not really violating any laws. Um, and the extent to which you want to delve into that further is, is up to your own individual discretion. I hope that answered the question. Apologize for the silence. I'd sing and dance, but I think everybody would probably log off. Okay, so Laura, you're getting back into those HIPAA things that we talked about. Um, you don't need to, to get into the specific absence, though. You can say, my child was absent due to an EE-related illness. And if it's documented in the 504, that should be sufficient. Um, that also kind of speaks to when we're talking about accommodations, because unfortunately, vomiting is a big trigger in schools. There needs to be something in there from the doctors that say, my child frequently vomits, or, or this child frequently vomits. It is not because there is a communicable disease. It is because of my child's disability. Please make sure that that's included in the 504 plan. Yes, I do think that the kids tend to be a little bit, um, a little bit better about handling a lot of this than, than we as adults are. Um, I think it's a natural thing as parents. We, we, want, we don't want our kids to hurt. We don't want to see them struggle. But we also have to remember this is something that they've been dealing with their whole life. And they probably identify the similarities between them and their peers more than they do the differences. And I think that's the beautiful thing about the spirit of a child is that they are so pure that they do look at the ways that we're all alike. Um, and that's why I think kids are their own best self-advocates when they're empowered to do so. So while we may be thinking we're teaching our kids, I think a lot of times we're learning a lot more from them than they are from us. And I'm glad. <laughs> I'm glad you agree, Michelle. Thank you, Lori. I appreciate the feedback. I'd also like to take this opportunity to kind of throw out there that um, if you have questions, you can feel free to email me at any time as well. It's the right to learn at gmail.com. Um, it does take me about 24 to 48 hours to respond to emails right now. Um, it's a little bit busy. This time of year, we're just having progress reports come out here in Georgia. Um, but also understand that if you are not in a state that I'm unfamiliar with, it's very hard for me to give you specific advice. So the more information you can provide me in the email if you ask a question, the more adequately I can try and guide you in the right direction. Um, but if you are interested in finding an advocate in your area, I again would repeat looking at the fedaweb.com for the yellow pages. Um, and I, I believe it's, the, it's somewhere near the top of the page and it, it does say yellow pages and you can just type in your state or um, I think there might be a drop down box. I can't remember exactly, but that's a great place to start. Thank you. I appreciate that. I, I hope that everybody has been able to gain something from this. Um, and again, if there's anything on the AppFed website that you would like to see improved with regards to the education information, please don't hesitate to let myself or um, somebody from the AppFed, AppFed organization know. Kelly, I don't know the answer to that. Um, the question is, do all children with EE have the risk of anaphylactic reaction? That's a, a specific medical question that I'm unfortunately not able to address. Um, and Gillian just pointed out that the next webinar will be with physicians. So hopefully that will be a great opportunity for you to get that question answered. Thank you, Heather. I'm glad that you found this valuable. Thank you, Janine. You're very welcome. You're welcome, everybody. Thank you all so much for your participation. I appreciate it.